Okay, we're, we're going to start. I'm happy to introduce this module webinar, this uh, webinar that will talk about a module on sexuality. And you will see that we'll learn a lot of very, very good information. So those who are in uh, Spanish, they can have to click on interpretation Spanish. Those who want the French, uh, ceux qui veulent une traduction française, cliquez sur l'interprétation française. And then those who want a Russian or no Ukrainian, uh, translation uh, can uh, click here on interpretation uh, English actually um, or I think it's English because Ukrainian cannot mark on it so click on English and you will actually uh, Ukrainian interpretation so thank you now I'm very happy to um, present you our interview Dr. Michael Crickman his latest book is The Sexual Spark Michael, can you uh, release your video? And I'm going to stop sharing. I think that's the best. And um, we'll, okay. So Michael, um, I, you are um, an expert in sexual medicine and you're a member of sec several societies on Sexual Med Society of North Medicine. Uh, you're also a very good um, guest uh, speaker on AFRM conferences, anti-aging conferences in USA. Um, and I think will um, benefit a lot of you, of your view, you know um, much more in several, several sectors of sexuality. Uh, do you want to say, just to say hello to the public? Uh, we have um, 83 countries and more than 2,400 registration. Well, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It really is a pleasure and a great opportunity to talk about sexual medicine. I uh, really appreciate the invitation and look forward to a very robust uh, discussion today about sexual health for both men and women. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Really happy that you're there and thank you for participating. Um, I will share with you my... Um, PowerPoint slides, as you see here, this is the sexual spark of um, Dr. Michael Craigman. Uh, it's one of his numerous books, uh, the latest one. Now, I will first talk about male sexuality. Um, sexuality for men is very important. I don't need to repeat that information uh, many times. And um, what I will see in models that are educational for physicians is, <clears throat> a lot of very interesting information that is normally not treated in hormone therapy. But um, hormone therapies are probably, in my experience, the most potent treatments to improve. You could say psychological treatments are good or some nutritional extracts, but hormone therapies are really very, very potent in my experience with my patients. Um, when you look, uh, for example, I will um, talk about sexual attractiveness. Also, this webinar, it's much more uh, deeper information in the model, sexual arousal and drive and libido, and also even erotic fantasy, what hormone therapies can do to improve that. And you will see it's, it's quite, quite potent. And also, for, even for the affection for the partner um, and longing. I have to correct something. Yes. Can just... okay. So, sorry, I have um, one of my assistants that needs to correct something, but um, can I continue talking? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, we really have a lot of different aspects that we'll see, also on erectile function, ejaculation, even the size of the genital organs of uh, men, how to increase the penis size with hormone therapies. So these are really very uh, um, important uh, features and they're still working on my computer, so I need to continue. Um, but you will see that we'll see also in this webinar a lot of information also on women and also on oxytocin uh, treatment. Is that good? Yes. Okay, they say I can go on. So um, here you see sexual sensitivity is also an important factor when you touch the skin of your partner, for example, what it does and how hormone therapies can improve the sexual sensitivity is interesting and is important for your patients. Um, also, pain is testicle health. We'll look also get information about sperm. You will have some of those slides here. And also, uh, of course, erectile function, ejaculation and orgasm in men. So let's go. What can testosterone do to increase the masculine line aspect of a person, a man, to, so that he's more attractive? Well, here's one of the, 
beautiful um, pictures of uh, the, the football player, uh, David Beckham. And I used it to, because he really makes a lot of pictures being the model for a man. And um, high serum testosterone are linked to actually a more masculine face. We're talking here about scientific research. And um, so if you, one of your pages doesn't have a masculine face, it might masculinize over the years with testosterone treatment. Here's a study that shows you that the higher the testosterone level are, are the higher this facial masculinity is. And you see, this is the, the graph. And, you, and you, what, what you can see on this graph is actually that um, you have uh, about 25 or 30% more masculine faces at the higher level of testosterone. So it's really a proportional increase. Then very important to know is that it doesn't really help to have um, those testosterone gels of 1%. They're, they're very low potency actually. Uh, and that's what you find often in the pharmacy. Now some of them have gone to 2% or 1.64% uh, transdermal gels. The transdermal gels are good, but you need higher potency in men. And so you need generally a liposomal cream of testosterone 10% to really make a difference in sexuality or give testosterone in, uh, injections like testosterone inentate or cypionate or decanoate. Uh, here, uh, testosterone inentate injections are given every 10 to 14 days. It's about 250 milligrams. So you need really to have the right uh, product for correcting a hormone deficiency in particularly to improve the sexuality of your male patient. Also, how to increase sexual attractiveness in men. You know that we're much attracted actually by the body scent. We don't know that generally, but the body scent is very important. And when lovers fall in love, but it doesn't hold, it's often because the body scent doesn't correspond to what it, uh, to be attractive. And you as a man or your male patients can do something about their body scent. What seems to be important is that having a too strong body scent actually repels most of uh, female partners. And here's a study showing that men taking uh, or, um, or, um, eating um, meat or not meat for two weeks. So alternative, they have two weeks of meat eating or non-meat eating. And then they have to put pads in their um, armpits to um, collect their uh, body scent by collecting there the pheromones. And actually what we see is that the armpit order of men presented to women here in those uh, axillary pads, actually um, non-meat, those who are non-meat diet, uh, are found by women who don't know the partner. They just smell the body scent of that man. They find it more attractive, more pleasant, less intense. If he's vegetarian or a fruit eater or a, a vegan, it, it is actually more attractive because the body scent is less. But the body scent is less attractive with more nitrogen when you eat a lot of meat. So if men have a too strong body scent, they should uh, stop eating meat for a while and probably eat less meat in general. Red meat consumption has actually been shown to have a negative impact on perceived body odor pleasantness. And also in order to improve the sexuality of men, you need to, to increase his sexual arousal and his drive. He has to be awakened. And um, one of the questions I will ask on Dr. Crickman is exactly um, why he uses an antagonist of 5 hcp for example, probably because 5 hcp uh, blocks the libido somewhere. So you see here, that's a good libido. You've seen most men are real gentlemen in their heart. Uh, they don't show it, but they, they should actually. And how can they increase their libido? Well, for them, the number one hormone to increase the libido in my experience is uh, actually testosterone. That's really the one who kicks off the libido of men. If you have low testosterone levels as a man, you probably won't have much libido. And um, so that's so well known. I'm not going to show the studies I show in my model, but let's look at MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. 
can it increase sexual drive and arousal? Well, there are derivatives that do it. And one of the strongest is melatonin 2 that increases sexual desire. Here's a group of men who had erectile dysfunction from psychological origin and organic origin. Uh, and they were submitted to a placebo and um, alternatively with melatonin 2. Melantan 2 was injected in these patients. And what you see is actually that um, with placebo, they were still with their low sexual desire. Um, that they had a 17, um, didn't improve, uh, three had a very low sexual desire, and none had high or very high sexual desire. But when they were switched to um, Melantan 2, those 21 patients, um, had a strong improvement. Actually, uh, we had five patients with a high libido, five with an average moderate libido, and three had just a low libido, and just six didn't really improve of those. So it's really much more potent than the placebo. And even thyroid treatment can help sexual drive and arousal in men. Most studies are in women, but let's look in the studies in men. You have men here with autoimmune thyroiditis or inflammation of the thyroid with antibodies, and they had severe hypothyroidism. And compared to men who were healthy, healthy thyroid and had no thyroid immune, autoimmunity, they had significantly decreased libido. And when they received the T4 treatment for six months, without having their um, autoimmune thyroiditis being treated, just treat the hypothyroidism, it normalized the sexual desire. There was no difference with healthy controls. What about, so in conclusion, I give of course a lot of slides in the model, but in conclusion, the hormone treatments, the strongest treatment for men to increase the libido is testosterone. And the first choice that I have, and I give to my patients generally transdermal testosterone, a, a liposomal cream of 10%. And you can give half to three grams, that's 50 to 300 milligrams. And of course, just a fraction of that really penetrates in blood and uh, will supply the men with physiological levels of testosterone. But you need to check female hormones because if testosterone converts too much to female hormones, Testosterone converts to dehydrotestosterone, super male hormone, or to uh, estradiol. It is a whole different because the estradiol will block the libido and will even block erections. So you need may not have higher than 25 picograms per mL of uh, estrogen levels. You need for estrogens, but not too much in men. And other possibilities to increase the libido of your patient, if this not is not enough, is, and and he 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 has uh, good testosterone levels, is melatonin 2, very potent. I would say it's even more potent. Uh, you uh, get a, a very strong um, drive for physical uh, sex. And bremelatite, which is very similar, and doses that I actually provide that are work can be once a day up to once uh, a week of uh, 0 0.3, 0 .0 0 0.1, 0 0.3 milligram per week. Melantan 2 has about 72 hours of efficacy. We'll see that later. DHA can help, but it's very slow to help. We'll see that also here. And oxytocin can also help, but it gives also much more um, romanticism to a man. So it's more romantic love that is, uh, increase with oxytocin, and I can tell you, out of personal experience, it's really very pleasant. And in my life, my wife likes that, that I take oxytocin, you get more attached to your partner. And I can tell you, it's like uh, being in Disney, um, in a Disney film, the prince and the princess who meet each other. Increase loyalty. How can you increase loyalty in a man? Because um, one woman, in my experience, is already too much. Having several women is, wow, what a job. And so loyalty can also improve really the pleasure in both partners. And the hormone that does that is the main hormone is oxytocin. Look at this study. In this study of 2016, uh, men were 
interviewed by a very attractive woman. And men who were single kept a relatively short distance of 57 centimeters. If the single males received oxytocin, they kept more on a distance. And they were as 14 centimeters more because those single males who were single there, they had a partner. And when you have a partner, you don't want to go to another partner. You're too attached. Oxytocin gives you this magic attachment. So it makes your life more pleasant and your love uh, relationship much more valuable. And that's one of says so your 14 centimeters long distance uh, is a sign of loyalty to their partner outside of the room. Sexual insensitivity. You have some men who really suffer. They, they don't feel much when they're touched. The causes, one of the causes here on the penis, on the genital, is circumcision. And why is that so? Here you see a little joke, but stop, stop, circumcision no longer recommended. He just said his first word. Okay, it's a joke, but it may be a little drama for the child. And um, why is that so? Well, circumcision removes about a third to half of the penile skin system. And it's in this skin that are the nerves for sexual pleasure. So it decreases very much the penile sensitivity. In this study of 2013, for example, you see what is in blue is actually intact foreskin. In men who have kept their foreskin, they have a penile sensitivity. In the foreskin lips, that's the greatest sensitivity sexually, and they have all that. The men who actually are synchronized, they are, the foreskin is taken away, and they have all this part of penile sensitivity that is gone. So it, it does really um, lead to a mutilation also in sexual sensitivity. So if it can be avoided. I know there are so some people are so religiously attacked to doing that. Um, but why not let adults, adult men, decide if they're going to be circumcised? I know it's more painful, but we have the methods to do it. But um, why should we impose that to boys who haven't asked, um, who haven't given their authorization? I think it's something that if adult men can decide, but not necessary parents. It's personal opinion. Sorry if I shock you, but I think it's important to mention that for sexuality, it is better to keep the foreskin for men. So this is what is lost. Now, gentle underdevelopment, some men are embarrassed by it. To understand that if you have a small penis as a man, or if your patient has a small penis, the cause is a low testosterone level and especially low dehydrotestosterone and low growth hormone level, as we will see in the next slide. But here, these are the tenor stages of puberty. And you see that gradually uh, at, there's an increase inside the penis and there's more and more testosterone. This is tenor stage three of puberty and you already have 130 nanograms per deciliter, still a low value for an adult. And then you see when it goes to 325 nanograms per deciliter on average, you have this size of penis. And this is stage five, the adult male stage, it's, uh, it develops for around 670 nanograms per deciliter, the reference values of adults between 300 and 1000 on average. <clears throat> so you need to be above actually the middle between these two values to get to this stage above at least 545 nanograms per deciliter. That's what, so if a man always had lower levels, his penis will be smaller, but if you can give him higher levels, even at adult age, you may have a growth, but at adult age, you'll have to add uh, the growth amount. Why is that so well here? Here's a picture that shows it. This is the penis of um, a boy who always had, um, uh, a growth hormone deficiency. And without the growth hormone, the penis cannot develop sufficiently. And so growth hormone therapy can increase the normal penis size. There are studies about that. I'm just showing one of the slides to give you an idea of um, 
what has to be done and what is the cost behind. So you need growth demand and dehydrotestosterone actually to really uh, un assure a good size of the penis and permit better sexuality by that. Male subfertility during sub uh, testosterone therapy will be discussed during the model. I, I won't discuss it here, but you need to give smaller doses of testosterone to avoid uh, decreasing fertility. But I want to point to one thing that is important. If you want to have a good fertility as a man or for your male patients, um, avoid a mobile phone near the testicles. This is a study where uh, sperm was taken from men and uh, the sperm was put during five hours near a mobile phone. One was in talking mode and one was just in reception mode. But anyway, whatever happened, especially the talking mode, it decreased the number of mobile spermatozoa in five hours time. And how many of us don't put the mobile phone in their pocket more than five hours a day? Shouldn't do that. Certainly not if you want to have a kid as a man or if your patient wants to have kids as a man. So it dec significantly decreased the number of mobile spermatozoa. It also increased the number of immobile spermatozoa. And it also increased DNA fragmentation. So the DNA of those spermatozoids was also of not good quality. It was broken down. So mobile phone radiation exposure putting it in a pocket uh, will give DNA fragmentation and decreased sperm motility. Not exactly what you need for fertility. Um, Biotherapy increases the number of the spermatozoids. This is a study on 388 men. And the higher the free T4 was in this man, the main thyroid hormone in blood, but not, but not the most active one, T3 is the most active. Well, the higher the serum free T4 was, the higher the sperm concentration was. So low, low sperm count is compatible with low free T4 and the normal or good high sperm count can be compatible with higher free T4 levels. So we generally, when a patient has a problem, it, it chronic for sexuality or for sperm production, it is often multi-hormone deficiency related. Thyroid, growth hormone is important that I'll show that here. Growth hormone is a fantastic treatment to increase the number of spermatozoids in infertile men. So you see, for example, these are four men with azospermia. What you see here, this is the testosterone level and growth hormone was given and growth hormone here slightly increased the testosterone levels but the azospermia, the absence of sperm in um, when the sperm was collected, it increased after the beginning of growth hormone. All these patients are treated also as FSH, that's the normal treatment to stimulate spermatogenesis, but it didn't work. And when you combine both with the growth hormone, it increased the sperm density up to uh, here almost 26 million. Above 20 million, you're really in the fertility range, ideally 60 to 80 million per milliliter of spermatozoids. Here you have another patient where the sperm density also increased once growth hormone was given, and it took about 10 weeks, like here also to increase. Here was eight weeks, there maybe 10 weeks, and you had also good sperm density, a little bit less, like to 15 million. That's still a little bit weak, but it's much better because there was no sperm before. And here's another study where it didn't help to give growth hormone. The sperm density uh, was actually um, remained azospermia. A fourth one, there was an increase in sperm density, very little, up to two million uh, milliliter per uh, per milliliter. As, um, and you see, it 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 was after stopping the growth hormone treatment because growth hormone has some delayed effects, and you increase the sperm density finally. 12 weeks after stopping the growth hormone treatment, but probably due to the growth hormone treatment. So that shows you the efficacy of growth hormone treatment to improve sperm density in infertile men. Now let's go to the main problem. Some men come for your consultation is erectile dysfunction. And you see, it is crucial for men to have good erections. So I had a 
uh, a woman who said, uh, look, I don't care if my man cannot have erections. I love him so much. It's okay. But for the man, it's not okay. Even if he didn't say so, uh, because he feels somewhere when he has this erectile dysfunction, unhappy, he has a lack of pleasure. He also uh, experiences, many men experience as a major loss of malehood and a major loss then of self-worth. If you're not a man, totally, you feel less worthful. Of course, you still are a man or still an important personality, but genetically, we men are determined they need good directions or they're not real men. That's what somewhere, even if they try to convince them, otherwise it's very hard for them not to focus on. So they feel like a major depersonalization. And it's also important because when a man has erectile dysfunction, he's starting to die in certain sense because he's developing cardiovascular diseases, as we will see. So it is, you need to take care, you need to find the cause, the hormone deficiency cause, behind the erectile dysfunction, because you will also identify, improve the whole situation, the mental, spiritually maybe, even, and, and certainly uh, physical uh, medical aspects that are um, like cardiovascular diseases and et cetera, and diabetes. So erectile dysfunction, uh, what you see, men with erectile dysfunction have 40% less flow mediated dilation of the brachial artery. That means that their arteries don't open up easy. They get rigid, stiff. They have a form of atherosclerosis. They also have more than two times more likely to develop severe coronary heart disease. And generally two years after a man starts having impotency, impotency problems, he starts developing coronary heart disease. Several studies have shown that. It, it doubles his likelihood of getting that the heart doesn't pump good to the blood because there's left ventricular dysfunction. Another study showed that there's 70% more cardiovascular diseases in, in men uh, with erectile dysfunction. And, and uh, so, so it's not very, very um, interesting for them. Also there's greater stroke risk, 43% greater in this study. Another study didn't show any difference in prostate cancer risk, but here we're having enough risk and there's more. I will show more in the model. So what are the hormone treats that can help erectile dysfunction? Well, there's a whole set of those. Which hormone therapies will improve? Well, DHEA testosterone can give a, a weak erection or moderate injection, let's say a moderate injection, like a banana. To get a stronger, like a, um, a, a close banana, not like an unpeeled banana, get a stronger erection, you can have to add Grotamon and IGF-1 and possibly oxytocin, but that's only in animal studies, not in human studies. But to get a very hard erection, like a strong concumber, you need to have the most potent hormone for erectile function, which is dehydrotestosterone, with testosterone, IGF-1 and growth one. IGF-1 and growth one give more volume to the erections. And MSH give, or, or other MSH derivatives can really give very good erections too, very hard, like for physical, uh, real phys hard physical sex, I would say. So you see that there are stages and some hormones are stronger for erections than others. Let's look what, what DHA and how DHA could work. Um, first of all, low uh, DHA levels have been shown uh, to be related with sexual dysfunction. Men with sexual dysfunction, with erectile dysfunction, have lower levels, significantly lower levels of DHA sulfate and free testosterone. And separately, the free, tes DHA, free testosterone and DHA sulfate levels are related to a higher I, uh, international index of erectile function score. That's the usual questionnaire that is given to patients to evaluate their erections. And so uh, the higher the DHA sulfate level is, the better it is. For testosterone, it's also known. And um, 
in the model, I speak on how to increase the spontaneous erections, morning erections, erection frequency. That is mostly well done with testosterone. It makes your quicker, have quicker erections, having erections in the morning. Um, but not the duration of erections and not the volume of erections is so with testosterone related. You see that this is um, the penis and a cut section. You see these are the corpora corvinosa that are filled up with blood in the blood sinuses. And um, the corpus spongiosum, that's for the evacuation of the urine, the urine tube. But here is its very important part. They have a lot of smooth muscles here. And when there's a castration, when there's a, a severe lack of testosterone in animals, for example, what you see is that there's a fibrosis. All these white little spots shouldn't be there, but that's fibrous tissue that replaces the smooth muscle cells. So you have much less pressure possible in the corpora carvanosa because you don't have the muscles and the sinuses, uh, blood sinuses are uh, obstructed by uh, fibrous tissue. And there's also a lack of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors that are important for erectile function and a lack, of course, of smooth muscles content in the corpora carvanosa. So you fibrose your, your, your penis. Now, in uh, many treatments for hair loss, for example, they give 5 alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride. They even give it to men who have prostate hypertrophy, and that's a bad idea. And um, that causes excessive decreases in serum DHI dehydrotestosterone levels, and that's not good for the erections. You see, for example, with finasteride, five milligrams per day, there's a 65% decrease in dehydrotestosterone, one of the main hormones for erectile function. And it takes, once you stop, in four weeks, you return to baseline level, so that looks okay. But you have to have a certain time uh, if the patient has, because of that, erectile dysfunction. With dutasteride, much more potent um, blocker of the conversion of testosterone to dehydrose testosterone, it goes up to 90% decrease of serum dehydrose testosterone after four weeks. And, and there's no complete restoration to baseline levels about four months later. So, so, so maybe not try dutasteride in men. Now, how to increase then the volume, hardness, and duration of erections? Well, you have Crotomon, IGF-1, and you have MSH, mental seed stimulating hormone, derivative treatments. MSH is the hormone that stimulates pigmentation. And when you look, compare to the classical um, compounds we use to improve erections, uh, you see that Cialis is maybe the champion. It keeps on being there 30 for 36 hours. And in 20 minutes time, you have an onset of the first effects of improving directions. With Viagra, uh, you, it's less long, it's about 12 hours, which is generally enough anyway. And, but it takes about uh, 40 minutes before it starts working, and Levitra 50 minutes. So there, um, there are differences between this. Let's compare with an MSH derivative. Mount Tattoo, for example. 72 hours, three days, full days, three nights, you still have easy and strong erections, voluminous erections. And it takes about 30 minutes, sometimes 50 minutes if you overdose. Uh, it can be relatively quick. So uh, Mountain 2 is better, I think, than these substances. But you should not exceed too much doses uh, and take it too frequently because then you get very brown in your face with Melantan 2. Here's a study with men with organic or psychogenic erectile dysfunction. And they were given subcutaneous injections of Melantan 2. And I can tell you a very, very high dose that can give side effects like nausea. But at that very high dose, it increased their sexual desire. And 63% of those who didn't have erections had erections. So almost two thirds of patients of those men had finally erections. And look at this. The erections was on a duration of 45 minutes. while well, before it was less than two minutes. 
that's that's about 25 times longer time for erections. Isn't that impressive? So on a rigidity score, it wasn't perfect. It was six to nine on 10, but where they had probably one or two before. So it's, it makes a big difference. They had about 20% of them had some stretching, yawning and nausea. Uh, and, and so that is actually a sign of overdose. How now DHA treatment, when you give DHA in the beginning, first eight weeks, two months, almost no efficacy compared to placebo. But after 16 weeks, 75% is reached for the international index of erectile dysfunction. And 92% after 24 weeks, which is about half a year. So it takes actually six months to get full efficacy with DHA and not only for erections, but you need to be more patient then you have to be with MSH, for example. What about ejaculation in men? Well, ejaculation in men is improved by oxytocin, dehydrotestosterone, more than testosterone, and MSH derivatives. Those are the three major ones that can improve ejaculation. And let's look at dehydrotestosterone, for example. You see that the higher the level is in blood, huh? you have actually more than one orgasm per week, more. So if they had two orgasms, they have three. If they go from a low level to an average level for a man and to a high level for a man, they have done three orgasms per week, okay? So it really works um, and it depends on your dehydrotestosterone that stimulates also very much your sexual sensitivity. And what about premature ejaculation? Um, well, many here with secondary premature ejaculation have been found to be low in testosterone and they have done the shortest intravaginal ejaculation times. They cannot hold their erections very well. So they hurry on and, and, and then they have too quick ejaculation. So there's no time for their partner to enjoy and to have orgasm on her turn. And I think it's not untrue. One woman said, in the newspapers, a journalist said um, it is sexual ne negligence from a man not to make um, his female partner uh, in, enjoy, uh, have uh, orgasm. And, and so you as a doctor will improve their relationship because you will make that possible, that uh, he can wait longer before ejaculation, um, your male patient. So testosterone replacement, increase almost five times the intravaginal ejaculation latency time. So he, the, the man can stay five times longer in the vagina of his female partner, thanks to the, the testosterone. And now let's look for hormone therapies for female sexuality. All you ever wished knowing, uh, I can tell you, it's a fascinating um, presentation that, that I have actually in the model and will look some of the slides of it. But female sexuality is um, very important. Uh, we have a life that is so hard and tough, so why not improve sexuality in your patients? That's pleasure. You don't need to be a king or a queen or, or a president or the most important person to enjoy sexuality. Even as a person with uh, not much money, you can enjoy life or non, uh, not so well known. You can enjoy life with some fantastic sexuality that doesn't really, normally doesn't cost much. Uh, it may cost that you correct the hormone deficiency, of course, and those treatments may, may be expensive, but not so expensive, you know? So what is the, how does the female uh, physical appearance attract men? Well, part of that, is by increasing pheromones. The pheromones, they go out. If a woman tried to increase that with palm fumes, but I personally prefer human odor, it's more attractive. And um, so pheromones have a structure like this. So it's hormones secreted by the skin to attract a sexual partner. It's a messenger. It uh, gives sexual excitement in a partner. 
So when you see a person, you're attracted, you don't know why, it's maybe the pheromones. So in the armpit order, and uh, these were women who wore um, arm, uh, arm pads in their armpits, and they were presented to men who didn't know them, so didn't even see a picture of them, and they just had to smell. And what was found is during menstruation, women have a strong smell that is repellent. And that's exactly what women should do at that moment because it's not the right time to have sex. In the follicular phase, when it's getting time to be fertile, the, oh, the scent becomes more and more attractive. And actually they have a less strong scent at that moment. And so there's not more repellent, becomes the scent become attractive for women. So women are well-made and they, um, if they have good hormones, they actually will have um, at the right time, the necessary pheromones to attract men. Now, what about increasing romantic love? We all know this. The prince looks at his future wife, falls in love, and they look each other into the eyes. What is the hormone that increases the gaze to the eye? Oxytocin. And uh, new lovers, actually, compared to those who need hugs because they're still single, like here, um, have higher oxytocin levels. So you, that makes part of the attraction. And I can tell you, I'm with my wife since I, I, I think it's um, almost uh, it's 36 years. I can tell it every year, I think my oxytocin levels go up because I, my love is greater and greater. It really is, it's not a joke. And, um, and you see, of course, I take also some oxytocin. Um, the higher the oxytocin levels are, the more the couples interact with each other with positive feelings, with touching each other, affectionate touch. And, and they're focused together on social things. So they form a team, a dyad, like it's called in uh, scientific terms. And it does also increase the anxiety and worries you do about the partner and the relationship. You want to keep the relationship because it's so, so good. Also increases sexual arousal and drive. How to increase that in women? Well, testosterone. Testosterone is the number one hormone in women to his libido, also for men. And when women take sublingual testosterone, there's a sharp increase of testosterone after 15 minutes and after 90 minutes, the testosterone is back to baseline. But that's not how it works. How it works is it starts working in the cells three to four and a half hours after intake. So if you take testosterone to increase the libido, you need to take it at least four hours before or three hours before. And then there's a start of beginning of genital responsiveness. And the more there's genital arousal, the more there's sexual drive and, and genital sensations and, and vaginal arousal, et cetera. So basically uh, you need those, that time lag of three to four hours and a half to get efficacy from testosterone in your patient. You need to tell that to your female patient. What about cortisol and DHA? What does cortisol do there? Well, look here. Woman with hypoactive sexual desire, you don't wanna have sex like here. Actually, they have low salivary cortisol awakening rise. So in the beginning, there's a high peak of cortisol, that's lower. And they have a 20% lower salivary morning cortisol. So they don't get a kick. And they have also a flatter curve of cortisol. Normally cortisol is very high in the morning and then slowly it declines towards the evening. But that's all flatter, uh, much less cortisol secretion during the day too. And uh, there's 35% less salivary morning DHA. So women with weak adrenal glands that make not much cortisol and DHA generally have low sexual desire. And you need to correct that also so that you have the energy to desire to have sex. 
they're too tired in this situation of deficiency, adrenal deficiency, to want to have sex. So you see, there are a lot of different aspects you need to take into account, but you can be as a physician, a magician who can improve that. What about MSH derivatives? You see here that there is bremenotide. And bremenotide increases the feelings of genital arousal about three times more and more than two times more sexual desire. So it works in women who are postmenopausal and, and have less sexuality. What about DHEA? Well, these are women with adrenal deficiency and they receive 50 milligrams per day of DHA, which is an overdose. Generally, women need 20, 20 to 25 milligrams a day of DHA. But okay, they were very deficient. So they received 50 milligrams per day during four months. What does it do on their sexuality? This is the initial status. And you see the placebo here is all lower. So the placebo certainly doesn't help these women. But for frequency of sexual thoughts or fantasies, so the erotic fantasies, that is more than double than with placebo with DHA. And that already improves after one month. Because you remember for men, erectile dis dysfunction, um, DHA only works after four months and then after six months, even better. This is after four months. And you see that the degree of sexual interest takes more time than one month, but it's also very well improved. Level of mental satisfaction, physical satisfaction with sexuality, all are improved with DHA, significantly improved later after more than a month of DHA. So again, it takes time to get full efficacy of DHA, but at which time, if you're a patient, it can help significantly. So DHA works for sexual fantasy. Now, also important with DHA is that it can improve the clitoris. And uh, you see here, the clitoris size is depending on the serum DHA. Uh, in clitoromegaly, when it's, the clitoris looks to be too big, and in the women who have that, there are significantly high levels of DHA and androstenedione, the adrenal hormones. It's even more than with testosterone. And why is that so? Well, probably these women have always had strong adrenals with a lot of secretion of their uh, adrenal androgens, while testosterone comes up later at more adult age in women. So also here you have women with clitoromegaly and hirsutisma. They have even a greater relationship with DHEA and clitoral index. Um, so if they have body hair overgrowth, they probably have high levels of androgen antigens. So of course, the clitoris is bigger than. And how to increase in women's sexual intercourse? Make that they do more sexual intercourse. Well, this is a woman who have had their ovaries uh, taken away. And the number of coitus per event uh, without any treatment, uh, so they're estrogen and progesterone deficient uh, is, is low. It's, it's less than one uh, uh, a week. And it's even still less with one week with estradiol. There's a slight improvement when they receive only estrogens. But if they receive estrogens with testosterone, you almost have uh, two and a half times more uh, quitus evens per week. So it gets to be almost one and a half time per week in these women. Um, for the great satisfaction, I suppose, of their husband. How to increase orgasm in women? There's one hormone who's outstanding in women, and that is oxytocin. And you see, for example, women who were asked to self-stimulate to five minutes beyond orgasm, the higher the serum oxytocin was, the greater the intensity of the orgasms was felt by women who had easily orgasm because they could be they were called multi-orgasmic women because they could have with one sexual intercourse several orgasm and also the high oxytocin levels the the orgasm is so great that even there are contractions of the anus uh anal contractions 
so that means that the whole pelvis is full of orgasm uh, intensity, very intense. And um, what about fertility in women? How can you improve there? Are, I think about seven treatments that can, or, or, or the six treatments that can improve fertility in women. One of those is DHA. And this is a meta-analysis and of a series of studies and uh, where DHA was given to women who poorly responded to assisted reproductive technology. So to um, in vitro fertilization and, and things like that. And with DHA, they were much more fertile because it almost doubled the life birth rates. And um, in women who were identified as poor responders to this technology, this, it will work well. And I remember that there's a study showing that the higher DHA levels are, the more fertility is in women. And um, I remember that I was in Paris, I was giving consultations to people. And one of the physicians there I met said, um, look, my gynecology is completely crazy of, uh, of you. And I said, why? Well, uh, because uh, he followed your advice to give DHA to women uh, with uh, fertility, with infertility, and each of his women fell, um, fell pregnant with it and, and remained pregnant with it. So it was very, he found it, it was incredible how much more the women uh, were fertile. But that's, of course, anecdotal reports. But anyway, it's interesting to meet this sort of enthusiasm. Now, let's look at oxytocin itself. So I have a whole lecture of two hours on oxytocin that I even had to shorten because I have so much information on it. So it remains very practical and easy to follow and, and pleasant to follow. Oxytocin is really the hormone of affection and much, much, much more. And you have here, for example, oxytocin is secreted here, is, is produced uh, here actually in the hypothalamus here. And then it gets to neurons, axons. It goes and is released in pituitary gland, posterior pituitary gland into the bloodstream. And, um, and how can you recognize a person who's oxytocin deficient? Well, they're physical signs, pale face, no red flush. You know, when you have emotions, you have, it flushes somewhere here, no flush. I think I have flush a little bit now with emotions, but there's no flush if there's not oxytocin. Uh, I must admit, I took some extra oxytocin before the lecture, could feel better with it and probably smile more. And uh, intellectual, uh, the sort of, you don't show an emotion uh, face and prefers being alone. When you have a lack of oxytocin, you feel disturbed by other people. You don't want to have, that they disturb you. And so you probably be left alone. But if you're full of oxytocin, it's completely the opposite. You like people to come. You like to help them. You like they, they, to listen to them. You like to make them laugh and, and et cetera. And you see, this is the oxytocin rich smile, a real smile, it's communicative. You also want to smile. Let's look at oxytocin poor smiles. This year, oxytocin poor smile, a forced smile. You really have to force yourself because you don't smile spontaneously if you're very low in oxytocin. So oxytocin increased smiling and laughing. You see, healthy woman in a study looking at a TV comedy, and they received intranasal oxytocin. And they smiled more and laughed more than when they were taking a placebo. So if you go to look to a comedy film, try also, take some oxytocin before, you'll enjoy more. I tend to take a little bit more oxytocin before a conference, then I'm more sympathetic. Otherwise, I'm too serious, you know, that sort of rigid person who's mentally uh, a lot of willpower, but no, no much emotion. 
that's my style if, um, without oxytocin. And I, I don't like it. I prefer smiling. Um, oxytocin may also decrease stressful feelings. You have women who had to have a task. They had to look at a terrible film or a normal film that was not terrible. And with acute stress, what happens when those terrible films, they increase the negative emotions. And you have higher cortisol, meaning that the person is in an alarm situation and uh, faster troop reaction times that the quicker gaze away because they cannot see what is happening. But when you see the same film type or type of film with uh, in, in those women who looked at those films and had initially higher serum oxytocin levels, those with the highest levels, they actually had much better positive reaction to what was happening. They were not so stressed. And they even, because they were not so stressed, they could concentrate more on what was happening. They had a better cognitive accuracy. And so the fact when you have high oxytocin levels, it buffers the bad news or the, the stress exposure. It's an anti-stress hormone, especially in social interactions. You're not afraid of meeting people with oxytocin. And uh, oxytocin is probably, in my experience, the number one treatment to treat autism. You see these autistic, you see their gaze goes away and he forces his gaze upon. It's not a natural gaze, it's a forced gaze, like the forced smile. That's typical. Uh, children with oxytocin with um, autism and I think oxytocin deficiency and indeed those autistic uh, children have lower oxytocin level they do have more um, uh, derivatives of oxytocin that are not very efficient they also have at puberty there's a rise of oxytocin and that doesn't occur in those uh, children. They don't have the puberty-related increase in oxytocin. They also have disturbances, genetic disturbances of the oxytocin receptor. And when you give them oxytocin to, uh, you give oxytocin to uh, um, autistic children, they improve the eye contact. They improve social communication. They talk better. They meet people easier. They also understand effective speech better. So that means that um, they recognize emotions in other people easier. And, and they recognize intonations of emotions while autistic children for them, it's all the same. If you want to know how an autistic person uh, reacts, you have to look at the film, Good Doctor. That's the good doctor is an autistic doctor. He's very cute and, and, and lovable, but he really is autistic. And so you will understand he needs oxytocin. Also increase the reading the, of the mind and quality of life. Also significant decrease in repetitive behavior. They tend to you know put blocks one on the other and then it falls apart and they put again the blocks. That repetitive behavior is less, they, they will have less need to know, less repeating, less ordering, less need to tell and ask, all these constantly questions, less, less self-injury, uh, less touching themselves, they will touch others easier. And the interesting is to know is that oxytocin also is beneficial for the heart. It decreases heart arrhythmia. With the COVID uh, vaccination, I had one vaccination, it all went wrong. And, um, but I had also heart arrhythmia with it. And that's the reason why I take twice a day some sublingual oxytocin for the mom. It decreases ventricular tachycardia and auricular and ventricular fibrillations. So really, really good. It decreases myocardial infarction in rats and rabbits. It decreases the heart failure in mice and rats. Uh, very impressively, really. It's, it's And the cardioprotective effects, you know, the it at doses that are actually physiological doses for humans that uh, when you make the parallel between what is to given to rats and mice and humans you'll probably have to give in humans six internationals of sublingual oxytocin or 16 internationals of intranasal oxytocin 
it's more or less that sort of doses uh, to give uh, to mimic those effects. So you don't need high amounts. So oxytocin treatment um, can start by not giving oxytocin, but by um, advising to your patient to go into cell certain conditions like hypnosis or uh, meditation helps, increases oxytocin levels and positive imagery, looking at good positive images uh, in your imagination or, or viewing good things, even singing and reading books can increase oxytocin. So that's one of the things that can help. I have a, I have a book actually on oxytocin that you can buy. Uh, and that is really interesting. Um, um, uh, and it's not very expensive compared to my other books who are professional books who are uh, more expensive. And you see the doses that you need to give is sublingual so oxytocin on average is five international units a day. I take two times five international units a day to preserve my heart. It's also an antioxidant oxytocin. And intranasal oxytocin, you need to have more. It's, it's on general, it's at least two pump, two sprays, two, three sprays of eight units per day um, spray. In the model, I will also present patient cases of sexuality in uh, male and female patients improved with hormone therapy. We won't have time to go over. So let me, before I interview Dr. Kreisman, um, interview some of the slides here um, about the books you can buy. Uh, you can order these books uh, in America at UCPRX, but you can also have outside of the USA, uh, in all other countries, you, you um, buy them at Hertog Medical School. The Reversing Physical Aging book, the Hormone Handbook, that's the number one book to buy if ever you have a book you want to buy. Atlas of Endocrinology for Hormone Therapy is very useful because you need to recognize the science of hormone deficiency in your patients. Testosterone therapy for real gentlemen, really with all the information on sexuality in men uh, is here also more than just uh, testosterone, uh, really interesting. And then you have a e-learning, you can do, uh, you have a choice, you can take separate courses, you can take a whole model, that's a subset of several courses together, or you can take um, an educational medical program in anti-aging medicine or in longevity medicine, as we prefer calling it, or in uh, hormone therapy. Several grades are there. Uh, my team can give you all the information for that and send you that. And among the most recent programs are, um, there's a model on inflammation and, and, and there's uh, um, infections, reversing physical aging is one of the most sold. Also chronic fatigue and burnout, fascinating one, thyroid treatment, melatonin, testosterone in men and women. And you have many of those cycles are available in Spanish. I think it's actually the full nine models, nine models here are already in Spanish available. Among the most recent is the ones that I just recently did in the last year is uh, all these treatments like the hormone therapy consultation. If there's one model you first want to do, this is the one to do. Uh, you have psychological disorders with a lot of clues. I, I personally don't understand why psychiatrists are not working with hormones all the time because it's just more efficient. And I know that because I was an assistant in psychiatry and I switched over to hormone therapy when I saw the terrible need in, in, in hormones that these patients have. Longevity, that will really fascinate you. And the sexuality is a must for, I would say, any physician, even for his own enjoyment of sexuality. Cardio and cerebral vascular disease is the one I'm working on and obesity also. But there's so much more uh, that you want. It's really interesting always with scientific references, but what is even more important was practical information. And we have also uh, the Global AIDS Management Academy in Ukraine um, uh, that have translated part of the, um, my presentations in Russian. Uh, so you can uh, go on that uh, website if you're Russian or Ukrainian. And uh, we don't play politics here, we, we think, uh, Doctors are outside of uh, politics and, and health professionals. Here's their uh, Global Age Management Academy from Ukraine. So um, 
My next events is I will be in Baku, Azerbaijan for Longevity Congress on March 15, 17. So if you're in the region, go there. But even if you're not in the region, I think it's worth it's all in English. Three days with one day pre-conference workshop where I will talk about what makes you live longer, the psychological attitudes and the hormone treatments and the nutritional treatments. And uh, in the main session, I will give a lecture on living longer with Crotomo and IGF-1 and something very special that I can tell you, it's probably very strong, how to awaken the shaman in you, because I believe spirituality is a specialty of almost all doctors. They have a predisposition that they can use in their um, um, consultation much easier than you think. And so you have here the info, uh, vivalavidacongress.com that you need to click on, vivalavidacongress.com. Uh, and then you have also here the A4M Congress in Orlando in May, eight, on May 18, I will give a workshop on inflammation. And I think this is really, really great, um, uh, of great use for your patients. All the information you have from lifestyle like sleep and, and physical activities, meditation helps to decrease um, uh, inflammation, diet uh, also. And I will talk about adrenal hormones like hydrocortisone and DHA to reduce inflammation on the main session. So info on the A4M, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. I will do a, give also a webinar uh, with, on a Canadian Congress with Nelly DeVers on topical melatonin, how it cures the, or helps the skin. It has great longevity effects for the skin. And I will be in a Congress in Mexico where I will give two days of workshop in November in Mexico City on 17, 18. So reserve that date if you live in that region, you will won't regret it, it will be extremely practical, it answers a lot of questions of doctors. And I will be, of course, in December at the World Congress in Las Vegas. Uh, partners, I really thank our partners, all these partners, the have like Farmanor, Viva La Vida, LIMS, uh, et cetera, Access Labs, uh, um, Biosil, they all are very helpful in uh, helping us make it possible, give you free webinars. And this is the address where you can also buy things, uh, office at hertalk.eu. Um, and there is a special promotion. I don't see the promotion here, but there's a special promotion that is this one. Uh, if for those who want to go on courses, they can get 50% off if they buy a whole educational program, which is really interesting. It's a 20% off of the price. So you just put your mobile phone, and then you have the information. Now, um, useful addresses is really these two addresses are very useful. This is the email office at hertalk.eu. Now I'm going to interview uh, Dr. Kriegman. So let me see, I stop sharing. Uh, Michael, could you put on back your video and your audio also? Is it possible? Okay. Yeah. Good. Perfect. I wonder how I can just be us two. Uh, no, I don't know. Follow on Swiss. I don't know. Well, okay. I don't know how to do it. So we'll keep this vision for the moment, but normally I should be able to make, um, uh, I don't know if the other uh, participants that of the, this webinar are able to see all the other panelists because I prefer not having that. But okay, I have my team is going to come. Okay, but in the meanwhile, I will ask you questions and are you- It's okay. It's okay? Oh, okay. So I don't have to worry. Um, Michael, um, you have a lot of interesting experience. I think with Villa C, I think it's pre-Manaltide that is sold now in the United States. How does it work and, and how often do you have to take it and how do women react? Well, you know, I think it's very interesting. Vilesi is uh, bremelanotide and it is FDA approved. Um, it's an auto injector. So this is taken prior to sexual activity um, and it's an injection that women take really as needed. 
Um, How many you know, some time, women, minutes or hours before sexual intercourse? Well, it really depends. You know, usually a half an hour, 45 minutes before um, in terms of, you know, taking it. So it's, it, it's in advance. So it's a PRN medication that you can take in anticipation of sexual activity. Um, and it's quite interesting, um, you know, and again, um, I think some women uh, have gravitated towards it, where others find the concept of a PRN type medication or as needed much more challenging. What so in contradistinction, PRN? as needed. So oh, yeah, it, okay. it is not a chronic medication, as opposed to something like Addy or Flibanserin, which is also approved for HSDD, generalized acquired HSDD, or hypoactive sexual desire disorder in the United States. Um, Flibanserin is taken chronically every single day. So you're always ready and it's going it, to, it has to be taken on a regular basis. I think the concept for a as needed medication may not necessarily always work for a woman given the dynamics and the other issues that are involved in terms of the relationship, in terms of the interaction as well. So um, that's kind of the feedback that we've heard. So how long um, does it uh, keep on working uh, these injections on um, the outside? It can work for several hours thereafter. So, and again, remember, um, you know, I think the, the big drawback is there has been some challenges with some of the adverse events, nausea and vomiting. So if you have a woman who is very prone to that, then it may be a problem, right? Okay. So, and again, um, I think you have to choose selectively. I think, you know, um, Vilesi or bremelanotide, which is a melanocortin agonist, I think, you know, it typifies this whole um, discussion that we were talking about today. I think it's quite interesting, um, you know, as I was listening to the presentation, you were talking about testosterone, estrogen, um, you know, melanocortins. There's, it's really an intricate interplay of a variety of different uh, areas. And I think the issue, I like how you divided it up in terms of different facets. But remember that when you're talking about female sexual health, they're really like concentric overlapping circles, right? Yeah. So if you increase orgasm and orgasmic response or intensity or frequency, you're going to increase desire. Um, yeah. And if you I'm increase sure. desire, you may increase frequency. So they're very interrelated. Uh, I'm interested also, you were talking about these other products that you take every day. What exactly are they? Are they the risks of hormones or something else? Well, one thing that I found interesting that you um, didn't mention, and I'm sure you mentioned it in other lectures, is this concept of uh, nitrates and nitric oxide and how important oh, that is to overall general health and wellness. And we know that... Um, you know, as a person ages, you know, um, the nitric oxide that's naturally made in the body, you know, over 40, it falls. Um, we have the decreased ability to produce a nitric oxide pathway, very, very important for vasocongestion, very important in a whole variety of other facets. Remember, uh, nitric oxide acts as a neurotransmitter in the brain. It releases oxytocin, the LHRH, which is really important in modulation. So it also I releases oxytocin. oxytocin. Yes, of course. Wow. Yeah, and that plays into, into that. So nitrates... I think is very, very important. There's some discussion about this precursors, right? Um, you know, using arginine or L-citrulline, but our ability to break those down decreases. So you have to kind of bypass that and use really nitrate supplements, nitrites and to nitric oxide. Um, and whether it's from your diet or from supplements, I think it's really important and really realize that there's a variety of different changes that have happened recently, right? Um, and I think, you know, you need between about 300, 400 dietary nitrates a day to see the impact. And we only, we don't really eat that much. And again, many of the soils in the United States, there was a lot of studies that were done that they removed the nitrates. And so you're not getting the same amount from your diet. So supplementation with nitrates are also something to think about so as what well. Goes in and what, sort of, 
what dose and what sort of product would you give and how is it given exactly? The nitrates. Well, um, the exact dose, I think, you know, you really have to, um, you know, I would, I would get back to you with the exact dose of recommendations, but I think, you know, you're taking it on a daily basis. And I think, again, it works with in conjunction for men, you know, if they're on PD-5 inhibitors, you can see the additive effects of the, the medications. Like is it a Viagra, capsule or a tablet or what is it? Is yes, it? it is. It is a tablet. And no. one of the, I mean, one, there is an organization that I, I like very much so, and they, um, they have a test, a saliva test that actually works as well. So, you know, most of them, it's very interesting because most, when I was um, tested myself, I was deficient in nitrates and I didn't even realize it. Um, and you can really notice a difference once you use these in combination. So I think one of the um, one of the other things that I think is quite important to remember is that it's a layered effect, right? Um, that what that means is there are so many ways, um, you know, to help, um, you know, sexual function. And where do you start and how do you layer it? Some people, I don't really believe in what I would say, you know, the cluster. The cluster is we give everybody everything right away and we kind of um, just hope what works. I think that it's really important for you to layer uh, effects. So I certainly believe that we should, you know, look at estrogen and testosterone oxytocin certainly very critical then we add in things gradually and see how people respond i'm not one for giving everybody everything all at once and then seeing how it um how it works no right? that makes sense because you you are uh, um you will the patient also has to learn from the products the doctor also has to learn how his patient reacts if you have too many products you don't know what's really happening you um right if I, we go back to those nitrates, is that something you take sometimes or you take it every day? No, you would take it every single day. You and then would. you increase the dose when there's sex or not necessarily? You can take a supplemental dose, but again, this is really on overall, you know, um, so, you know, it's a dietary nitrate blend. I mean, it is there, you're taking two capsules or depending on the brand. So I think it, really is very important to take it um all the time it's, so it's not once as, a day or time. two times a day it's once a day once a day in the morning or in the evening it doesn't really matter doesn't i mean really i take matter. it in the morning yeah and okay. i and some sometimes you you know you may want an extra boost um taking it in addition right before you know maybe an hour or two before you plan sexual activity but as we know you know i'm also a sex therapist and sex counselor right and sometimes best intentions don't always happen and you mentioned that before that you know um sometimes you can't plan when you're going to have sexual activity best plans may not always happen um so again i typically like these daily medications daily routine, giving people testosterone on a regular yeah. basis, DHEA, oxytocin. So you're always ready. I think that the challenge that I've seen, especially with the PD-5 inhibitors, the Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra meds are, there's an added element of anxiety that you take when you're taking something as needed, right? You're taking the medicine and you're saying, oh, I'm taking it. What if it doesn't work? What if they're not interested. No. What if it, you know, I'm going to waste it. I might have side effects. It's expensive. But when you're on a daily dose, you're always ready. So the other facets of sexual activity can come into play, I think are very important. That's good. Um, now, there are also some products we didn't, I didn't talk about, but that block sexuality. Like, for example, progesterone in women. So I usually say to my um, female patients, please take it uh, before really falling asleep, not before six. So that's one of the things. Um, I personally take also, for example, progesterone uh, because it helps me for several reasons. And uh, I, I'm very uh, careful not to take it before six because uh, it might block me quite a bit. <coughs> and there's also, is it possible that um, there's also um, uh, serotonin or 5-HTP that blocks uh, 
desire or libido or not? What is your, because well, I, think I think work with antagonist of 5-HTP. Well, if you look at it, I think the big issue, you know, um, the big issue progesterone causes sleepiness. So again, for women who are on hormone therapy, who are on estrogen and progesterone, you tell them after sex, uh, right before bed. Um, and again, remember that for some women, progesterone is uh, has a very, very bad negative effect on mood. And mm -hmm. some women really can add, have an adverse reaction to that as well. Like they can have severe depressive symptoms and what have you. So you certainly need to be very cautious with that as well. Um, where we see the biggest issue with the serotonin access is really with this, you know, with the depression medications. We see very often a lot of women, especially in the US, are not on hormone therapy. They're taking SSRIs or serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, and they negatively affect uh, sexual function. They negatively affect desire, arousal, orgasm. And again, um, some, some of the antidotes, um, you know, interestingly enough, there was some studies that showed that Viagra, uh, Sildenafil, in women who have SSRI induced sexual dysfunction, can reverse that. So again, a low dose may be helpful. Um, if you look at flibanserin or Addy, it's approved in the United States for HSDD. It's a 5-HT1 agonist, 5-HT2 antagonist. So it's really a serotonin modulator. And when serotonin is out of uh, I would say out of balance, I think it's quite important to recognize that you can go one way or the other, that you can have depressive symptoms, you can have uh, changes in desire. And again, regulating that, I think is very, very important. And phlebanserin is the medication. In addition, there was some uh, other studies that mm -hmm. were done um, from an, a smaller company, which was looking at combination medications, right, of testosterone and uh, agonists or antagonists looking at different types of libido. You can have anxious lowered libido where you are more anxious and then using an antagonist or an agonist might be helpful in that situation as well. So combination medication, and I'm not really sure where they are in terms of their uh, study, but again, I think the the difference for me, uh, I have worked in the male field and certainly um, more entrenched in the female field, is that the aspects of sexual function for women are much more dynamic and there's more multifactorial issues. Um, as you mentioned in your lecture, relatively simple to give a man an erection, uh, give him motivation, give him drive and what have you. I think the challenge that may happen for women is you may have a woman who's very replete with hormones and she's wonderful with her testosterone and her estrogen and her, she's on oxytocin and she's doing very well. Um, when she's alone, she may be sexual, but when she's with a partner, it may be a problem. So again, um, I just, I want to reiterate the concept of the whole whole psyche right remember yeah and that's why i love the concept of the shaman in you the the biopsychosocial the the brain is super important um in terms of helping regulate that so we have women even more than the brain i would say the soul the spirituality there's yes. a little joke about uh, this uh, problem with women that is maybe not a problem because uh, apparently there are solutions is that when an italian man comes at home he goes, he's real macho, he's beautiful, and he sits before the TV and he does nothing. On the contrary, um, so he doesn't have much sex because his wife is not attracted to him. On the other side, um, the ones who have the most sex in Europe are Austrians, and Austrians are Germans, and when they come home, the first thing they do, well, what can I do to help you? Um, can I bring the kids there where? And they have actually more sex. I tried it myself and it seems what uh, triggers the best 
is to help um, hang the laundry. You know, you hang the laundry really right. the that a man wouldn't do because it's, uh, but that works very well uh, to stimulate libido, <laughs> my partner. Right. But again, and, um, you understand, right? The, the biggest yeah. adverse issues are privacy, time, fatigue, yes. life management issues. And we like to think that relationships are liberal and equal, but if you look throughout the course yeah. of history and even in different societies, um, women are still the caregivers of children, the cookers, the cleaners, they work in the home, out of the home. And then at night, they're expected to like wave a magic wand and become a seductress. Yeah. And very often fatigue and stress supersede and can squelch a great hormone evaluation. Right. Yeah, and men, men need to know that they need to help their woman also at life do their part of the work and not just the hero, the macho is uh, the best. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> it's a teamwork. Um, good. Um, you also are trying, uh, you, you give pine bark or fenugreek, I think plant extracts that helps. So how how right. does it help? Or when do you give it? Do you give it also constantly or do you give it then uh, occasionally? Those are, there are, 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 are a whole variety of different kind of supplements that, that are really separated from the others. I think that it's really important to examine the evidence when you're thinking about a combination of supplements. Um, there is one that um, I've been involved with in terms of clinical study. Uh, it does have pine bark in it. It's a, it is for overall sexual satisfaction. And again, layered effect. Sometimes women aren't ready to go on testosterone, but they want to start with a over-the-counter supplement, and this might be helpful. Uh, same thing with fenugreek. It modulates, fenugreek modulates estrogen and testosterone. So um, again, the, fener the fenugreek modulates estrogen and testosterone may give you a little bit of a boost. Um, and then um, if you're talking about the compilation that has the pine bark, that might work by the nitric oxide that we talked about earlier pathway in terms of vasocongestion, uh, vasodilatation, increased engorgement, increased arousal. And again, you know that if you improve arousal, you have more conscious awareness of your responsivity. Another thing that I wanted to mention also is um, I'm working on a very exciting new project and it kind of interrelates with what you're talking about in terms of oxytocin. This is a really novel product for women. It's topically applied to the nipples and it causes, really causes um, slight contraction of the nipple areolar complex, which results in increased oxytocin. And I did the first trial in my office. Um, it was actually a randomized sham control trial. And we showed that women who applied this to the nipples um, had improved responsivity in their FSFI. So they had increased arousal, increased orgasm, uh, stronger orgasm, what have you. So again, remember the intricacies of the interrelationship of testosterone, estrogen, oxytocin, and there's so many more, right? Uh, that we don't even have time and to talk about today. This topical, is that oxytocin or is it uh, something that makes them release? Oxytocin? No, it's a, it's a topical over-the-counter product that causes contraction. It's not oxytocin, but it, it yeah. is something that causes contraction of the smooth muscle, which stimulates the release of oxytocin. Okay. And something you take occasionally or again uh, every day? You can take that regularly or you can take it as needed. You can okay. you take it, it works about 30 minutes. Yes, 30 okay. minutes before anticipated sexual activity. Okay, that's good. What, what would be um, the advice you would give to a person who has a problem with her or his sexuality and goes to a doctor? Um, should he just ask, uh, help me? Uh, or is there specific questions he should ask to see if the physician is the right physician? And um, Well, what I always say is you need to build your healthcare team carefully, right? Um, and just because somebody is a self-proclaimed expert doesn't mean that they're really an expert. So do your research. Um, I also think it's very important with your first interaction with the clinician. I always say you have um, two ears and one mouth. Your clinician should listen twice as much as he speaks or she speaks. So I think that's really important to 
partner with somebody. And really, again, we have all the these different market. things in our in our war chest to treat sexual problems. And we have to do what I would call precision medicine, really tailor the treatment to what is conducive for the patient. And there's a lot of different facets that are involved in decision-making, right? Shared decision-making, very important. Some women are very, very scared. We didn't talk about this. And we probably, a whole other lecture could be about the concern of hormones and breast cancer or the concern of hormones and the adverse events. That's another layer that we didn't talk about. A lot of women want hormones, but they're completely fearful. So if you if you prescribe them, they're not going to use them, right? So again, tailoring your treatment to what the patient's needs are. Some women come in and say, hit me with everything. I want to, I want to feel better. I'm not worried. Other women are very anxious and they want to go very slow and layered. So really a personalized approach is very, very important. Good. Um, now what I propose is we're going to answer questions um, and I'll try to find also questions that you in priority could, could answer. Uh, maybe the first question is DHA, uh, a patient who is DHA is very low, SHBG very high, and the patient is a 30-year-old <coughs> woman. Sensation of loss of libido, fatigue, enormous hair loss, skin aging. Do we treat with DHA and testosterone to a person who has enormous hair loss, that scalp hair loss? I would say no, because DHA and testosterone will increase that. You need to give to a 38-year-old woman estrogens and progesterone first, and then you can add some testosterone or DHA. So not without female hormones. What is your opinion, maybe? Same. No, I would agree with you completely. Now, I agree. here's a question that I think I cannot answer and you cannot answer. What is the right value of menotan 2 in serum for men? I think it's not checked in lab, so you, you cannot know what's uh, is, um yeah, that's uh, what about azospermia? Is it possible to reproduce spermatozoids? So I mean, it means if a person has azospermia, is it possible to make spermatozoids reappear? I showed a slide with growth mom, but what is your um, experience? Have you had experience with azospermia or that's not the sector you're working in? That's that's currently not the sector, but you know, um, I think that's really important when you're talking um, about giving men hormones and testosterone that you talk about the potential issues related to the effects. And um, what I find is very often that they're not appropriately consented. So I think that's an important point to bring forward. You mean uh, the fact that if you give high dose of testosterone, you decrease uh, spermatozoids right. production, yeah. But there's many things is that uh, usually when the spermatozoid production decreases because there's too much conversion of testosterone to estradiol. And it's right. estradiol that blocks FSH, which is the main hormone of the pituitary gland to stimulate spermatogenesis. So we're very attentive not to uh, have high estrogens because it has a lot of side effects and that makes it better for the sperm of a man. Um, well, this is a general question. Maybe you can answer that. Is erectile dysfunction normal after the age of 60? I think many physicians say that to their patients, but what is your opinion? What is well, your I would say not even 60. I would say after 40. Um, you know, it's all downhill after your 30s. And that's just a part of aging. You know, the veins, arteries, and nerves, um, everything ages with time, the responsivity. But I think that, you know, this concept of normal, I don't know if I ever use that word when I'm talking to patients. Um, these are things that are going on that are transpiring. Um, and, um, you know, even an 18 year old can have episodic erectile dysfunction for a variety of different reasons. Yep. So again, um, there are many, you know, I think it- Causes that we don't think of, for, for example, if, um, a man drinks one liter of soy milk, he will have erectile dysfunction in the evening. <laughs> At least uh, I tried it and uh, because of phytoestrogen. So there are many things that are easy to improve, but you just need to know them. Uh, right. What does it? And uh, you take progesterone in the evening that will also block and, and things like that. So um, 
probably if you the patient finds a physician that can find can look all over those aspects, it will be better. Um, here's a question you might also answer. I have the answer but on it. You is there an oxytocin supplement as pills, not nasal spray? Because um, um, I use all over the world. I use the oxytocin troches, so I get them compounded at a local pharmacy. Yeah. So there's um, a possibility of get them sublingual, and um, that's under the tongue that you put them or in troches uh, somewhere near the gums. But there's also a possibility. There's an uh, I think a pharmacy in the United States that makes a uh, uh, how do you call them slow release form. For uh, because it's also given for to decrease fibromyalgia, the pain in the and and that is useful for when it needs to stay a long time in your body. So there's a lot of difference, but generally the only brand you can find in a pharmacy is an intranasal form, and the sublingual have to be compounded by compounded pharmacy. Uh, what is the dosing schedule of melatonin to prevent darkening of the skin? Um, you, you have to give very small doses of melatonin one and melatonin two to prevent darkening of the skin because it's indeed given to darken the skin because it's MSH derivative. And usually um, I don't go uh, higher per day than 0 0.1 milligram uh, if it's given every day, uh, except if you need to improve the skin darkening of a patient before that that patient goes to the south to get to avoid sunburn, then in a week time, you may give higher amounts because it's then very quick to improve suntan. Uh, must the melatonin be injected daily? Do you have patients where you inject daily the melatonin too? Um, I'm currently not using that. Right but you're using VLS. So VLS is only occasionally then when you use Correct. it. Correct. You cannot Correct. give smaller doses of it. I haven't seen such a VSO. It's just one shot. You yeah, have no choice it's of as needed. giving small doses of it. Yeah, and again, there is, um, you know, people use usually use, the, there are some women that are using it every single day and they're having sex every single day as well. Yeah. But, you know, on a daily dose, it's not really advised at that. Don't they sun you know, dark? The Don't they get too dark with their skin? Um, that's not one of the most reported issues, um, you know, in terms of dosing. Um, the the nausea and the vomiting was the biggest issue because it's very had. high dose, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, what is the right value for dehydrotestosterone for men? It's six hundred fifty, you know, seven hundred picograms per ml is an average dose for an average sized man of dehydrotestosterone. But usually, we don't use this test anymore in blood. We use um, androstenedione gluconite, which is. Um, a very high level of a metabolite of dehydrotestosterone. Its level is on average in men, um, 1,500 picograms per ml or 1.5 nanograms per ml. And that gives the effect of dehydrate. So if there's a risk of getting excessive body hair or losing scalp hair, you may not have a too high level of that hormone, but if it gets too low, it will be erectile dysfunction in men. In a woman, there will be regression of the vulva. So you need to check understand diol gluconide in blood to know if you have too much or too little uh, DHT, dehydrotestosterone. Should I be careful when prescribing 50 milligrams to a patient? Uh, are you giving DHT at 50 milligrams, Michael? Um, for, for women, typically I'm doing 25, men 50. Okay, well, then you answer. Um, if 50 milligrams uh, in a woman can give scalp hair loss, body hair overgrowth, so it can be too much, and acne. Acne, uh, there are two hormones that give acne, is DHEA and testosterone. So you need to be careful at high amounts. Now for men, 50 milligrams is not a problem in general, uh, but that's the highest dose that I usually give in men who are the most deficient in DHEA. Can postmenopausal women with calcified fibroids or thick uterine lining take DHEA or MSH or hormones at all? You are a gynecologist, Michael. So what would you give to so, a woman? I mean, I think, 
and thick. The, the fibroids are not an issue. I have no problem with fibroids. I think the thickened lining is the other issue that needs to be addressed first and foremost. I mean, technically, if she if she is having abnormal bleeding, it needs to be evaluated. Ultrasound and endometrial biopsy. If the lining is greater than or equal to five millimeters, she needs a biopsy to rule out any kind of underlying pathology. And if it's normal, then that's fine. Um, so your limit is 2.5 millimeters? I'm sorry? Your limit is 2.5 millimeters? Five, five, five millimeters. Five minutes. So it's above? Right. Okay, it has to be checked. And typically, if you're thinking about local hormones for, um, for vaginal dryness, intravaginal DHEA is a good choice because the endometrium does not have the enzyme that would convert it to estradiol. So, you know, endometrial oh. cancer or people that have a history of a thickened lining, you can use intravaginal DHEA suppositories to treat vaginal dryness. Incidentally, that um, product, Prasterone, it's, it's uh, approved in the United States. There was a study that showed that intravaginal DHEA not only improves symptoms of vaginal dryness, but also may increase libido as well. Good. Three and what messenger. is the dose in these ovules that they give? What is the dose? It's 6.5 milligrams and it's nightly, every single night. So it's not a high amount and that's enough to decrease vaginal dryness. And um, yes. they also do it, I think, with oxytocin, but there the dose is much higher, 600 international units. And I think that is something like 1,000 micrograms so it's one milligram no it's not so much but anyway for oxytocin it's a lot okay can oxytocin lead to premature ejaculation i have a double answer there but maybe you can answer that um really i i i would defer to you i'm okay. i i use more oxytocin in women than i do with men although men certainly appreciate it and yeah. um i'm using it not in very high doses so oxytocin is um, very potent to improve ejaculation in men. I've, I had a man who couldn't have an ejaculation during five years. He could have sex, erections, no problem, but no ejaculation. And uh, when I gave him oxytocin, and the dose was two times five international units per day, um, he said he had eight times on 10 intercourses ejaculations. So it dramatically improved him and gave him again. Now, for premature ejaculation, there are two types of premature ejaculation in my experience uh, in patients, in men. First, um, the men who cannot hold an erection very tightly. And so he has to hurry to, um, to um, get an erection uh, and an ejaculation. And so he has uh, premature ejaculation just because he's afraid of not holding his erections. And then you have the person who really uh, can um, has too much erections, too easy erections, and too easy ejaculations, maybe because of a psychological disorder or because he's overdosed in oxytocin. So uh, you, you need to be careful. But I didn't find that oxytocin increases premature ejaculation in my patients. I never had a patient complaining of that on oxytocin. So I, I think it, it's, it's very safe. And it, um, but in order to um, treat premature ejaculation, you need to make the man having better erections that he doesn't have to hurry throughout the process. And otherwise, you, you probably know this, um, there is um, also, they give sometimes those SSRIs like uh, Cipralex uh, that uh, delays erection if there's no other possibility, but I just showed a slide that if you give testosterone or, uh, to these men with premature ejaculation, they have five times more delay before they get ejaculation. So there are a lot of solutions that help, but it's, it's often several factors. Um, here's a question. Apparently there was an assistance on that after breast cancer, chemo and radiotherapy, hormone dependent and tamoxifen is DHEA recommended? What were your reaction be as a gynecologist? I would, I mean, it depends what you're using the DHEA for. DHEA intravaginally for vaginal dryness and for improved libido, certainly you can use it. Okay, good. 
Um, I wouldn't give, I wouldn't give at that point, I wouldn't give oral um, DHEA at that moment. I would try supplementing vaginal suppositories first and foremost and see where that falls. Okay. There's also a possibility of giving seven DHEA. And then uh, you need also to face some facts is that um, these patients may need female hormones because 13 on the 14 studies that I checked where female hormones were given after breast cancer um, decreased the recurrence. Most of them decreased the recurrence and uh, increased the, uh, decreased the mortality very much. And the most striking results when where female hormone were given in hormone dependent cancer, that's these are uh, cancers are actually um, uh, tumors that have a lot of receptors of estrogens and progesterone, so they are not very cancerous. They're still uh, almost normal tissue, and that's why they have a lot of uh, receptors, and they actually are less dangerous cancers, and in those cancers, um, you have a 70% decrease in one of the studies of recurrence of breast cancer. Yeah. In a I mean, of that still remains controversial. I mean, I certainly have some women on that. Um, it still is in the U.S. still very controversial if you have even estrogen receptor positive and progesterone receptor positive hormones. And don't forget, 50% of tumors are androgen receptor positive as well to give them back systemic hormones. I mean, very controversial. I certainly have a group of women who are on it. Um, we tend to choose different types of products. Um, you know, if you look at the uh, CIRMs or selective estrogen receptor modulators, like things like Premarin, which is, um, it really turns breast cells off. So we do have, um, a lot of women who are on that as well. Uh, so conjugated equine estrogen, which is really a combination of a CIRM, which is really a, a negative, it turns breast cells off. So if you want to use an estrogen, that one would be the choice. But again, I would I would caution, it's still very um, a very touchy subject about replacing hormones in somebody who has an estrogen dependent you, you, hormone. You need to keep your license as a doctor. <laughs> yeah. But um, the fact is that there's a lot of signs that you can do a lot to, for these patients. And what we do right. is we give a lot of nutritional supplements that are protective. And then we give, if we give female hormones, we always start with lower doses of estrogens. We do it very safely and we make them signed in informed consent form where they get all the information. Um, and, but up to now, it always has been very, very safe actually. Um, um, but it has to be, like you say, personalized. Every treatment has to be personalized, not only to the hormone situation of the patient, but also partially uh, taking into account the, um, the, the anxieties of the patient. Uh, we shouldn't give a treatment that increases anxiety, uh, et cetera. How much oxytocin to get a healthy response? I took 100 units, had no response. 100 units, you... Um, uh, you um, acquire adrenal deficiency. So you're completely burned out. I tried um, to take 40 units. I was completely burned out. I found that I was not friendly. <laughs> I took more. I got very irritated, very irritated. Um, I was completely burned out. And actually it's because it decreased cortisol. So 100 units, best way to have an unhappy life, except if it's given maybe for women vaginally or something, but if it's directly uh, under the tongue or uh, intranasal, I, I, I can assure that I think it will cause a lot of problems of uh, feeling uh, a brain burned out with low blood pressure and things like that. Yeah, and again, I think it's important to recognize that everybody everybody's response is different, right? Yes, so true. it's better to start slow and increase than go yeah. high and you know, have a problem. And I've had women who respond at 10 or, or 20 as well. Yeah. Then there's also something special is that you need time for the efficacy to come. Like I showed uh, for DHA, you need to really have optimal effects six months for efficacy. And I think for oxytocin that you need more than a day or a week or two weeks, or et cetera. So for example, uh, some patients have no efficacy the first month and then the second mon uh, month they start to have efficacy by taking it daily. 
And, and then if they take an extra dose because they go to a concert or to meet people, or they will have sex in the evening and they took it in the morning, then it works half an hour later or one hour later well, but not in the beginning. There seems to be a sort of a time you need to um, get more enzymes probably or more receptors for it to work and then it works. So I think it's the same for oxytocin. You need time. Um, Okay, uh, what I'll, I'll look at other questions that I have here because I had them on a the paper, but apparently not anymore. Um, is there, uh, okay, uh, just let go a little bit with to prevent. Here's a, a question in, in French. Um, DHA is known to accelerate the hair loss uh so uh, shouldn't we avoid it because uh, uh it it has that effect what would you think uh the way i give dehydrotestosterone is just to by giving testosterone it converts to dehydro and that's the way so i i don't think we have to avoid it. we have to avoid excess levels of dehydrotestosterone. Um, and again you want to you want to go slow and monitor that's what my my opinion would be go slow and monitor and i tend to not see that kind of issue hair loss hair gain because i tend to go slow to kind of gauge how people are going to respond rather than go high and back off because once you go high and you back off they're already very upset and they're not yeah. they're they've lost confidence yeah i think that's really um the way to go. What are the right values levels of progesterone for postmenopausal women? I typically don't measure progesterone levels at all because I'm not, I, uh, the only time I'm replacing progesterone is if someone is on estrogen and has a uterus because of some of the negative adverse effects that you have mentioned. So I'm typically not measuring it. Um, I'm typically following symptomatology. So, and again, I do not, if somebody has had a hysterectomy, I don't replace progesterone per se, because progesterone, as you mentioned, has some adverse events. It's also proliferative in the breast, which also can be contributing to some concerns about imbalance between estrogen and progesterone and more of a risk for breast cancer. Yeah. So... Um, it's exceptionally rare that somebody is only on progesterone. Okay. For me. Um, I may, may give two answers here. First, um, the values of progesterone for the menopause, there's a reference values that is anyway too low. It doesn't correspond to anything. If you give a, a progesterone treatment, on average, it's 100 milligrams of micronized progesterone. You generally have higher values than the reference values for postmenopausal women, so it should be higher. But it's true that the progesterone has not a strong binding to its transporting protein in blood that is transcortin. And so it's very um, short binding, short duration binding. And so you, you cannot really follow up a progesterone treatment with progesterone um, uh, blood levels uh, because of this weak binding, it goes quickly in the cell. So you cannot really get the average value over 24 hours. You would have a progesterone unless you take a transdermal progesterone that is put then on the upper chest. And that's a 10% liposomal cream. That's a possibility, but it doesn't work as well in my experience as the vaginal or the oral uh, progesterone. Second thing is I do give systematically, so it's a little difference between us progesterone in the um, uh, in women who are hysterectomized because you need progesterone to calm down the brain to protect the brain because the bi-identical progesterone, uh, there's a study of that showed that quite well, that bi-identical progesterone does not proliferate it, uh, the, um, the, um, the cells in the... Um, the breast, uh, the epithelial cells in the breast, but the medroxyprogesterone acetate and the androgenic derivatives of progesterone do. And so when you give transdermal estradiol, it increases the proliferation of the epithelial cells of the milk glands. 
and you give conjugated estrogens, it also increases, that's an oral estrogen that also increases the proliferation of the PLO cells. But when you give to transdermal estradiol, the myconized progesterone, bioidentical progesterone, same structure in the body, it decreases very strongly and neutralizes the, the estrogen induced proliferation of the epithelial cells, while the medroxyprogesterone acetate are androgenic derivatives of progesterone, they increase further the proliferation. And so you're completely right that progesterogens in general increase it, apparently to my information, not the myconized progesterone. And I never have had, apparently didn't have breast cancer in my patients where I give the myconized progesterone. But of course, I also advise patients not to take too much estrogen if they have breast pain. They may not have breast pain with a treatment because breast pain uh, with a female hormone treatment is linked to two to four times more risk of breast cancer. That's an imbalance actually. So again, it's a titrating and personalizing to each patient. Um, here's a question that is a bit out of the context, but I will answer it. It's uh, from a Dr. Gerardo Contreras. Is it possible to use Levimir, that's insulin, long-acting insulin, instead of Mecasermin, that's bidentical uh, IGF-1, to increase the IGF-1 in the long term? Uh, yes, it is possible um, to increase IGF-1 by giving insulin. Insulin is one of the stimulators of the secretion of IGF-1. I had a patient who was very weak and didn't have the budget to to buy Grotamon or IG1. She was very weak. She had had a trauma, lost her husband, was in bed the whole day with other treatments like sex hormones, uh, thyroid hormones, very small dose of thyroid hormones because she was very thin and uh, cortisol. She could sit six hours of her bed very difficultly. And then because she didn't have the money uh, to buy the growth month that would have taken the exhaustion away, I proposed to take very small doses of insulin it wasn't the long acting was short acting. There was one or two units before each meal. The improvement was dramatic. She was very thin. She got six kilos more, three kilos of fat more and three kilos of muscles more. But what was fantastic is she could get out of her bed, did six kilometers of walking every day and recovered a full-time job just by the insulin that had indirectly at extremely small doses increased her IGF-1 and her growth mode. So there are possibilities to do it <coughs> and efficiently. Uh, is the, uh, are, I don't know if you can answer that, but are the synthetic pheromones applied on the skin really functioning? There's few studies on it. I didn't really find studies with synthetic pheromones, so I cannot answer. Do you have some answers? Um. I don't, I don't know of any specific studies as well that have shown that they're efficacious. I mean, there's a lot of claims out there, but there's no data to support them. Yeah. Yeah. I think. So you have to try them yourself and see it works. <laughs> That's often what I do right. if I don't have data. Can you give, um, here's a doctor, a doctor out of Belgium, can you give some MSA derivatives if he or she has had a melanoma before? Would you give Viles, Viles if a person had had melanoma? Um, I would probably tread cautiously and see what other opportunities there were for treatment. It wouldn't be my go-to for the first one. Yeah. Uh, in the literature, there's no study showing that um, these MSA derivatives increase uh, the risk of melanoma. But there are anecdotal studies that people who injected themselves to get darker uh, were feeling actually much better and went much more in the sun. And so they got easier melanoma. So if there's really a relationship or not, it's not proven. But in vitro studies, that means in studies on cell cultures in laboratories, uh, the MSA derivatives decrease melanoma proliferation. At least I have two studies on that. There might be a, a third study showing something else, but then I didn't see it. So we might have to be cautious. There's not enough data, but normally MSH derivatives protect the skin by darkening the skin. And by giving them more pigment, they should be less uh, um, skin cancer and melanoma. 
but you may not go more in the sun then. Um, what medication are they talking about? Uh, well, I don't know what that is. I don't, MSH derivatives, that's uh, like pre melantide or uh, melantan 2. Uh, can you sp please spell the names of the meds Dr. Krishman is talking about? He's talking a bit fast to catch the names of the med. Can you repeat the main meds like FDS, for example? And uh, okay, so Vilesi is by V Y L E S S I for Vilesi or Bremelanotide. Yeah. And Flibanserin, F L I B A N S E R I N or Addy. A D D Y I. Okay. Ian, a question you could answer. When do you consider filiacy in a perimenopausal woman? Um, I, you know, for me, I think the issue for Vilesi is it's not frontline. You know, for a perimenopausal woman, you want to look at testosterone, estrogen first, oxytocin, and then, you know, maybe a second line, flibanserin or Vilesi. Um, and again, um, you know, the woman has to be agreeable to get an injection, do it as needed and what have you. So it's not a frontline medication. Okay. I think you have to go in a stepwise fashion. Here's also um, for you. What kind of diet provides three to 400 of dietary nitrates per day? Um, you would have to, you know, again, you would have to Google and see which are the things, you know, there's certain fruits, vegetables, leafy greens, uh, beets that have high nitrates, but again, um, it's, it's relatively, um, challenging to get the amount of nitrates from your diet. Um, you know, I advocate a, a Mediterranean diet. It's been studied, uh, Mediterranean fruits, vegetables, not processed food, limiting alcohol, uh, it's a cardioprotective diet as well. So I think that's a very important issue to remember. Okay, so we can Google the information. What is the effect of aromatase inhibitors on sexual function? So aromatase inhibitors like aromatase and astrozole. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very important issue. I mean, they they block the conversion from testosterone to estrogen. In women, it's associated with uh, severe bone issues, uh, osteoporosis, osteopenia, severe vaginal dryness, loss of estrogen stores. Estrogen is uh, next to non-existent. So you have a hypoestrogenic state, um, which really, um, you know, kills the estrogen in a woman. For men, you may need it because if you don't want their estrogen to get a little bit higher, so it's in very low doses. But for women, it's a prevention for, um, you know, breast cancer recurrence. So you have symptoms of vaginal dryness, pain, uh, reflex hypertonus. You have dyspareunia, lowered libido, yeah. changes in orgasm, intensity, and latency, and what have you. Okay. Um what is the name of the nitrate product that you would recommend? Is there a certain brand or what? Um, I recommend Berkeley Life. Um, that's the one that I have the most expensive, uh, most ex experience with. And it's available through a clinician. It's two tablets daily. And the thing that I like about it is that they do offer a test that you can put in your saliva and you can check to see where you are in terms of are you replete or you're not replete. Okay, um, maybe a last question for you and then I'll have a last question for me is, um, I think it's more a testimony, uh, a person I think from the, the Latin America uh, says, um, because it's in Spanish, that the dose uh, is probably 100 for nitric oxide, 1,000 milligrams of arginine, and 500 milligrams cit citrulline. Or do you give higher doses than that? Well, I think the issue with the arginine and the citrulline is that as you age, your ability to transform those, those are precursors for nitric oxide. The ability to, tra to transform those is lessened. So, you know, I think it is much better to just use the nitrates than use the precursors. Okay. 
Good. Um, then maybe the last question, because we're getting now uh, later. Uh, what's the dose for oxytocin for autism? This is, has to be personalized. Um, I had um, children that were diagnosed oxytocin, small children, three years, five years. And usually the dose is like one or two international units sublingual oxytocin. Sublingual is a little bit more efficient than intranasal. But for more severe cases, they have receptor deficiency and you might have to give higher dose. The doses that are given in the United States in studies are between 30 and 50 international units, but that's probably too much. That will probably give adrenal burnout. So I think you will you just have to have patients, make them take twice a day in the morning and before the supper oxytocin and uh, like two times five units or two times 10 units as a maximum. I would really take that max and just wait. And, and it takes two months or three months, but it will be better on the long run in uh, my experience. But my experience, of course, relatively limited. I don't have a lot of uh, uh, very autistic patients, but I would say more than 50% of my patients are on oxytocin. So I do have an experience with, let's say, um, patients with um, oxytocin-like symptoms like withdrawal and uh, lack of sociability and things like that. Okay, I think we, we there's so many questions. There's a double more questions still waiting, but we, we have to make a term. It's everybody's getting also a little tired, I think. Um, Michael, Dr. Krishman, I really thank you. I think uh, you've been very, very interesting and I've learned a lot of different things. So I, I like that and I, I thank you and I hope we'll be able to cooperate also in the future more. And I yes, thank you, thank you so much for having I, me. I just want to give you a thank the audience that we have had more than 2,379 prescriptions. Uh, there was a quarter of an hour before it started. And we have 83 nationalities. The most important ones is France. It's translated into France. United States is number two uh, with 345 physicians. Philippines is number three, 272. Belgium, number four, 243, Mexico, 1,000, no, it's 186, and then Ukraine is number six with 88. And then you have a lot of other nationalities, Italy, Spain, and Argentina, uh, Brazil, and things. So uh, thank you for the audience of being there and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you, Michael. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Uh, all right, end it. Well, uh...